All right, it's time to learn about my man, Gibby Gibbs, and his equation to describe free energy. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and write that out first, and then define some of the variables and talk about what exactly I mean by free energy. So delta G is going to represent a change in free energy. And free energy is either going to do one or two things in a system. You're either going to gain and have a positive change in delta G and gain energy, or um, a system is going to release energy to the environment uh, or lose energy, and then it's going to have a negative delta G. So delta G is just the change we're seeing in a system or a reaction uh, that we can track to see if it's gaining or losing energy. And remember, free energy, really what that means is that this is the energy that's going to be available at the end of our reaction. So is there going to be more energy available or less? Our next term we see is delta H, which is going to represent a change in enthalpy which is really just the total amount of heat that a system has. So it's either going to gain some heat or it's going to lose some heat. And there are two terms we see associated with a change in delta H. Uh, a reaction can be exothermic, meaning it releases heat, or it can be endothermic, meaning that it actually absorbs and gains heat. Our T in the Gibbs free energy equation just stands for temp. So that's our temperature. And the delta S is going to represent a change in the entropy or the randomness or the disorder of a system. That's going to tie into our second law of thermodynamics, which states that pretty much everything favors chaos. It takes energy to keep things together and to keep things from falling apart, which is why, again, like in the last video, I said that um, in order to keep a building from falling apart, you have to do maintenance on it. If you have a vehicle, you have to maintain it. You have to put your energy or someone else's, you pay them to fix it. They're using their energy to keep your system, in this case, car, house, from falling apart and disintegrating into nothing. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example. I like examples. So remember, spontaneous reactions are going to typically increase the entropy of the universe. So spontaneous reactions, it doesn't mean instantaneous, right? Oh, looky what we have here. That's our Campbell biology textbook that we all know and love so much, right? You, I'm, you know, you may see this textbook as a, a facilitator of knowledge and a source of information. Well, I look at that textbook and I just see fuel, all right? So we, you and I both know that this textbook's not going to spontaneously combust. Um, if so, you should... You know, I don't think I could actually allow you to take them home where you live, uh, where your house, or, you know, wherever you keep all your stuff. It's going to, like, catch on fire when your book catches on fire. That's ridiculous, right? These are not going to spontaneously combust. However, as everything in the universe, in a billion years, I really doubt that this Campbell biology textbook is going to look like the Campbell biology textbook. It's likely going to be ripped to shreds or it's going to be scattered across the universe as a bunch of little atoms that once was part of the Campbell biology textbook. Just like you are made of atoms that were once likely in some star somewhere that have over billions and upon billions of years shaped and formed you. And that's like energy, my friend. Things like that don't just come together. But anyway, Let's take a look at this. So um, we got our Camel Biology book here, and it's complex, right? It's a nice, solid textbook. So even though it's not going to spontaneously combust, um, let's, let's uh, see what we can do 
and take a look at what happens when we light this sucker on fire. Okay, that graphic's like really sad, but honestly the best I can do with what I got here. So, we have increased the temperature of our textbook. And in the in turn, that is going to increase the change in entropy. We are literally torching a solid, which is going to eventually, I mean, this textbook's going to be a pile of ash. Um, what is happening to, how is our enthalpy changing? How is the heat that was stored in the bonds of the textbook, are we seeing an increase or decrease? Well, in this case, you're definitely going to consider this to be a exer, exothermic, sorry, exothermic reaction because heat's being released. You can literally feel it. If I burn this right in front of you, you would feel the heat coming off of it. So this is an exothermic reaction um, because we are literally releasing heat. Um, this type of reaction is going to be spontaneous, okay? It took a little spark a little activation energy to fuel that flame but still counts as spontaneous right um this is going to increase the entropy all those molecules around your textbook um, are going to heat up and start moving around that's an increase in entropy and you can also think that your textbook as a whole is much more ordered when it's you know not a pile of ash and a bunch of heat that's been released into the universe. So this is going to represent a exothermic, which is actually going to be a decrease in our delta H or a um, negative change in enthalpy. So it's exothermic, it's releasing heat, and it's going to represent an increase in, intro, in uh, entropy of the universe. So you're definitely creating a more chaotic state here. Um, and that's going to be... Um, a spontaneous reaction, your overall delta G change is going to be negative. So what that means is that there is less free energy available in the pile of ash than there was in the full-blown, thousand-page, thick, boring textbook that you had before. Let's look at another example that I think can trip some of us up. So you have a reaction where you're turning liquid water into ice. So if I asked you, hey, what has more heat trapped in it? The liquid water or the ice? Which one's warmer? I think you're going to say that the liquid water is going to feel warmer than the frozen solid ice, right? So in this case, when we look at our change in delta H, because, you know, the, heat, uh, the liquid water has more heat, Right, so more heat over here. And the frozen solid ice has less heat. What that means is heat, in, in this case, has been lost. All right, so you're losing heat. So that's going to be a negative, a, change, uh, a negative change in delta H. Or we can say that's exothermic, right? Heat's being released. There's way less heat in the ice then there is the warm room temperature water whatever so then when we look at the entropy which one of these do you think is more ordered which one's more chaotic the liquid water where bonds are breaking and reforming and breaking and reforming between water molecules or solid ice where the water molecules are sort of stagnant. They're not really breaking and reforming bonds. Um, they're kind of at quote unquote arm's length with one another in terms of the hydrogen bonding that's occurring between them, uh, which creates spacing, which is why ice floats. Um, so really you can see liquid water is more chaotic. So we look at the change in our uh, delta S here, our entropy. We definitely have more chaos going to more order or less chaos, right? So to me, that means that our entropy is decreasing because entropy is the randomness, right? The more random, the more entropy you got. So because we're creating order and a less chaotic state, in this case, we can say that the entropy is decreasing. 
So in terms of is this a spontaneous reaction or not, um, the answer is yes and no. It depends on the temperature, right? So if we stick a glass of water in a below freezing freezer, so below zero degrees Celsius, that is going to be spontaneous. I would expect that the water would freeze because that's kind of how freezers work, right? But if you had a water bottle on your desk and we're just minding our own business in class and all of a sudden just like froze solid, one, I'm going to be like, it's the end times because uh, magic's not real and I don't know how the hell that just happened, right? So that's not natural, okay? If it's not really the natural way of things, you can kind of think that's not spontaneous. Things do not naturally order themselves. It takes energy. It takes a change in environment or temperature. So if it's above zero degrees Celsius, that would not be spontaneous. No way. Things do not spontaneously freeze at room temperature. That makes no sense, right? Just like if I dump Legos out and they started spontaneously clicking themselves together, there's something going on, you know, like that's not how things work. I have to put my energy from the chemical bonds that are breaking inside my body, AKA digestion, cellular respiration. I got to use that energy to physically pick up the blocks and click them together to build my Lego structure, whatever it may be. Okay. Things do not naturally build themselves. They just don't. So typically spontaneous reactions are those where things are breaking apart. They are fav favoring a more chaotic state. And um, it's just a more natural way of how things work in the universe. All right, let's take a look at a few more examples and then we'll wrap this puppy up. So exergonic, that's another phrase, okay? There's a lot of phrases in here that all kind of tie together. So exergonic reactions are going to be reactions that release energy, right? So exothermic released heat, right? Exergonic is when we're seeing a release of energy, right? So if you look at cellular respiration, the graph kind of looks like this, where you have products here. Oh, Totally just screwed that up. You have reactants here, sorry. Reactants here, products down here, right? And our reactants of cellular respiration are going to be C6H12O6, glucose, and that sweet, sweet O2 that you're breathing, okay? So our products are starting here. It's kind of like that you are here sign on a map. So what happens is just like the glucose or the sugar sitting on my kitchen counter isn't gonna spontaneously combust, just like your biology textbook isn't gonna spontaneously combust, you need a little activation energy, right? That's the energy required to start an exergonic reaction, okay? So you gotta give a little to get some. So this here, you could measure that and say that's the activation energy required to make this reaction happen, which is a lot of times why even sometimes adding heat, you can consider adding heat um, is gonna speed up a chemical reaction most of the time just because it's helping break the bonds in your molecules. Heat is going to increase the entropy. It's gonna increase the disorder. It's going to help bonds break, right? And we know that by looking at our Gibbs free energy, right? Increase the heat, increase the crazy randomness we're looking at. So during the process of cellular respiration, you take that glucose and you just rip it apart. You just rip her to shreds, okay? And what that's going to do is it's going to release and cause a change in the energy available in that glucose, right? Because that glucose represents a high amount of available energy stored in those bonds. It's very, it has a lot of potential energy in there, right? So what we do is when we rip that glucose apart, that energy doesn't just disappear. That's the first law of thermodynamics, right? That energy, energy doesn't just like poof and it's gone. That energy is going to be converted or transformed into ATP, 
and it's also going to be transformed into heat. So both of those are going to be um, where we see our energy being transferred. So originally it was in the potential energy in the chemical energy stored in the bonds of the glucose, C6H12O6, pretty complicated little molecule. Lots of energy stored in there. Your body's going to digest it, you're going to undergo cellular respiration, and then that is going to release the ATP and the heat, and what we're left with at the end down here is going to be carbon dioxide and water. If you look at the reactants versus the products, so if we look at, you know, we have our reactants up here. Here's the, you know, that energy, free energy line for the reactants. And then you have the products down here, okay? So what we're seeing is in our free energy, there's a decrease. The products have less free energy available than the reactants did. So, you know, the, the carbon dioxide in the, in the water don't have nearly as much free energy in them than that glucose molecule. So if you describe that, if I say, hey, what's happening? What, what is the change in free energy? Well, the energy decreased, right? The amount of available energy in this system has decreased because where did it go? It's in ATP and heat now, right? So this is a negative delta G reaction any reaction where the reactants have more energy available than the products, it's always a negative delta G, it's gonna be spontaneous, it's gonna be exergonic, it's gonna be catabolic. There's a lot of things that are kind of, all those terms are floating around, but they're all linked together. So let's look at the opposite. You got an endergonic reaction, photosynthesis. We can start with the products of cellular respiration, which are the reactants of photosynthesis as they are inverse equations. So you got that CO2 and water down here, and then you're going to have that C6H12O6 and oxygen release at the end. Um, unlike the last reaction we just saw, our this time when we look at the uh, free energy, the products have more free energy than the reactants. So we've actually seen an increase. So in this case, you can say, well, look at the change in free energy. Is the free energy increasing or decreasing? In this case, where you can say, well, we had, you know, glucose has more energy than available than our carbon dioxide and water. Um, so in this case, we can say we're having a positive change in free energy. The products have more energy stored in them than the reactants. However, we know, going back to the first law of thermodynamics, we don't just get energy from nothing, okay? Where did this energy increase come from? Where is the energy coming from? Because we know it's not created or destroyed. You can't just make energy. Um, and what it it's coming from is the sun, right? So photosynthesis is driven by sunlight. Plants are absorbing that sunlight and using that energy from the sun and they're taking sunlight and they're storing that energy into, the, um, they're storing the energy into the bonds of the glucose. They are actually going to fix carbon dioxide in the Calvin cycle into a complex glucose molecule that we selfishly human beings are going to reap the benefits of as we don't make our own food. Uh, we have to rely on this process, right? So we eventually get that energy from plants. So by the time we get, by the time we eat our food, you know, the sun, sun's energy has been converted into chemical energy and then we will get that um, by eating either plants directly or by eating an animal that's eaten plants, right? And that's going to tie back into the food chain thing. So overall, I did want to revisit that chart from before, um, just tying in some terms. So catabolic reactions are going to break bonds, release energy. Cellular respiration is an example. They're going to have a negative delta G because the products have less energy in them than the reactants, and they're going to be more spontaneous. 
Okay, they still require activation energy, though. That's what I wanted to um, mention real quick. Still require activation energy. That's fine. Still spontaneous. And these are going to um, just be overall creating an increase of entropy. They're going to favor uh, disorder and chaos. On the other side, anabolic, just like anabolic steroids build muscle, these are going to build bonds and store energy. Photosynthesis, prime example. They're going to have a positive delta H. They're going to be non-spontaneous because things do not spontaneously click themselves together, hence the non-spontaneous. So things do not build themselves. You've got to have energy. requires energy. You have to to store and get the energy from something. And this is going to actually cause a decrease in entropy because you're literally making things more ordered. Glucose is way more ordered than your spontaneous carbon dioxide gas that's floating around in the atmosphere. So overall, the reason why I always teach this chapter first is because as we move into cellular respiration, and photosynthesis. If you understand the laws of ener how energy works and thermodynamics, it's just going to make your life a lot easier as we move forward. So make sure that you're very comfortable with these terms and that if you see them crop up on a test that you know what exactly is going on. Um, and I'll just leave the video at that. No question this time, but hopefully this will help you guys out on your free energy poll.